Everybody, it's Victor Zarev with Cardiac Wire, and today we're going to be talking to Dr. Manreet Kanwar from the University of Chicago and Dr. Francis Pagani about the Intermax report and how LVAD impacts patient outcomes. With that, could you all tell us a little bit about yourselves and introduce yourselves? Hi, everyone. My name is Manreet. I'm a heart failure cardiologist by training. And as of two months ago, I relocated from Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to University of Chicago, where I lead the section for heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. My name is Frank, uh, Frank Pagani. I'm a cardiac surgeon uh, at the University of Michigan, and uh, I've been uh, uh, involved with the uh, LVAD uh, program for over 30 years now. Dr. Kanwar, can you give us an overview of the findings of the Intermax report? Uh, sure. So just as a brief introduction to the listeners, you know, every year Intermax, which is the U.S.-based registry for all patients who undergo LVAD, for all, I think, majority centers who place LVADs in patients, durable left ventricular assist device therapies participate in this uh, registry on an ongoing perspective basis. And it is currently housed in the Surgical Thor uh, Thoracic Society, or STS. And every year, an annual report is put out uh, in the month of November, summarizing the findings, any updates from the field, uh, in context to previous years, just to give sort of the overview of where things stand with all things durable LVAD in the United States. And then specifically, the second part of the Intermax reports tends to focus on a theme that is picked up for that year and then expanded upon. So last year in 2024, uh, Dr. Pagani had asked me to be a part of the uh, group of investigators to lead this project. Uh, so Dr. Dan Myers from UT Southwestern in Texas was the surgical lead. I was the medical lead for the initiative. And so to summarize the annual report, we had put out, you know, the, the uh, stuff that is uh, put out every year, which is the one year and five year survival. Now, we had chosen to focus primarily on HeartMate 3 LVAD, mainly because it is the only commercially available LVAD available in the United States at this time. So the first half of the report, you know, puts out data such as the five-year survival, which is about 63% for a heart mid-3 LVAD patients. But the trends are compared to the years before in terms of it being utilized primarily as a destination therapy or a long-term LVAD. And then talk about the, what we call Intermax profiles. In other words, what kind of severity of sickness are these patients profiled under at the time of LVAD implant? But specifically for the purpose of the discussion today is in reference to the second half of the Intermax report, where we zeroed in on outcomes on in patients who are young and defined as anybody below the age of 50. Now, the reason we chose this as a theme is that we find ourselves often quoting when we are talking to a patient, let's say they are being referred to us for consideration for either LVAD or heart transplantation, and we have an informed um, you know, meeting and discussion with the patient and their family, et cetera. And we talk about their individual risks, benefits of either options, what their life expectancy would be if they were to, you know, proceed with an LVAD or transplant. So the idea is that we can help them make the decision which offers them as an individual patient the maximum chance of prolonging their life. Now, that could be transplant for that patient or an LVAD or an LVAD followed by a transplant based on, you know, many, many different scenarios. Now, specifically, when we are talking to young patients, we want to tell them that what their individual risk is. And what happens is if you quote the data from, let's say, a registry that predominantly includes patients who are older, then it skews the data in sort of favor of an older patient population. So what we wanted to find out is how do young patients do? Are their risk uh, profiles different than those of if all comer patient population? So if I'm talking to, let's say, a 40-year-old, I can tell them what is their predicted survival, what is their likelihood of developing an adverse event post-LVAD, in that age group, as opposed to a generalized discussion of all comer patient population. 
And this is an effort we all do when talking to individual patients so that we can try and help them make the best decision that fits their needs for uh, what we would, uh, you know, or what we colloquially refer to as the net prolongation of their life so that it allows them to understand the options offered to them, whether it's VAD now transplant later or VAD as a bridge to recovery or transplant, whichever may be the best option for them. So what we found, Victor, is that when we look at this patient population as a subgroup defined as less than 50 or young, as we define them, then they actually have a very favorable outcome profile compared to when we look at all common patient population. So specifically for patients less than 50, we found that their five-year survival is 73%, which is not dissimilar to the five-year survival in this patient population post-transplant, which I think was the first uh, sort of big observation that we noted. We then dissected out not just survival, but likelihood of having adverse events. So we all know VADs are associated with adverse events such as stroke, risk of bleeding, risk of infections, et cetera, et cetera. But when we looked at all categories of adverse events, we found that young patients are actually more likely to have pretty favorable outcome. In other words, their adverse event profile uh, burden is, is, is much lower than that of older patient population. So to give you a specific example, younger patients have a 94% freedom from stroke, for example, which is much more favorable than what we often quote uh, to this patient population. Similarly, they're more likely to have freedom from bleeding, or in other words, less adverse, a less adverse event of bleeding profile. They're less likely to have device-related malfunction. So to summarize, in this patient population, younger patient population, we believe an LVAD could offer actually a much more what we thought previously were, um, you know, would be an adverse event heavy profile. And we were able to come up with this information that can allow us to have an even more informed decision making as we discuss this option, especially in younger patient population. Well, so it's very exciting that we have so much data now, both about that younger population and the older things that Intermax report. Um, I know you touched on a little bit about net prolongation of life. Dr. Pagani, could you maybe expand for us a little bit what the concept of net prolongation of life means? Yes. Um, one of the, really, I think the issue comes up mainly when we deal with young patients. And why is that important? Because if we, uh, if a young patient receives a heart transplant, that subjects that patient to immunosuppression and the potential complications of, of immunosuppression. And then there's a, a limited time frame that the graft may live. And then if a graft fails 15 years later, 20 years later, that patient is still fairly young in their life. And then obtaining a, a retransplant or performing a retransplant is very limited. Ret retransplant occurs only about Two to three or four percent of transplants that occur in the United States currently are retransplantation. So the option for another heart transplant after your first heart transplant is very limited. So to transplant, say, someone in their twenties, and then if that graft, uh, the the new heart lasts twenty years, even twenty five years, that patient may only be in their forties at that time and still quite young. So the thought is, there's a lot of potential limitations with heart transplant, that could we avoid those limitations and offer someone an LVAD? And, and the thought being that if you could support someone with an LVAD for five or 10 years, that's five or 10 years that the patient is not subjected to some of the complications of immunosuppressive therapy. And that uh, that adds... Uh, sort of that you're delaying the start of the clock, so to speak, on the heart transplant. So uh, before, what really what has allowed us to even think like this is the durability that we're experiencing and the longer-term survival that we're experiencing with LVADs, that this concept now, once a, you know, a, a sort of a thought uh, is now more of a, a, a real reality, potentially. That's very interesting. And in that same vein, we've heard uh, of LVAD being referred to as a great equalizer. Dr. Kanwar, could you tell us a little bit more about what that means? So, Victor, in, uh, you know, I joked that this was my secret agenda to sort of advertise these two hashtags, the net prolongation of life and LVAD as a great equalizer. And what this basically means is that when we looked at 
the subset of population less than 50 years of age, we looked at it from the lens of their gender, their race, their ethnicity, their psychosocial support system, and so on and so forth. And what we found, much to our pleasant surprise, is regardless of their sex, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, how much support system they have, and do they have what we consider traditional risk factors or, uh, you know, that could put them at risk for not doing well, regardless of any of them, their outcomes were not only excellent, but also equivalent. So whether you are a man or a woman, whether you are belonging to a certain race, whether you have limited resources versus plenty of a, a support system, regardless of all of this, your outcomes will be pretty good. Uh, so their five-year survival stayed north of 70%, despite you know any of these variabilities, as were uh, mentioned just now. And this is something we don't always see in transplant, where we do know that if they have, you know, certain risk factors, they may or may not do as well as if they don't have those. So in that sense, we felt that a VAD, you know, doesn't care about your your sex, your race, ethnicity, etc. And, and the idea, again, is that it should be offered, I would say, even more freely as an option when we have certain risk factors that are associated with poorer outcomes, let's say, post-transplant. So in that sense, we felt that for patients with end-stage heart failure, that can equalize their risk factors in a manner that uh, only a machine can, so to speak, and give them an equal opportunity to do well, despite their otherwise you know, perceived disadvantages. And so with those positive outcomes across the board, I'm curious, Dr. Pagani, have these outcomes for younger patients in specific uh, influenced your decision to offer LVAD first before transplant? Again, that's that's you know these data allow us now to really have a more in depth conversation with patients now because the decision making becomes a little more complex because before we would say if someone has has is failing in the in, in, with older technology we would prefer a transplant there really wasn't much of an option now we have to ba basically uh, inform patients and providers uh, you know. Theoretically, there could be another option, and we have to go through the data and show them what the potential options are and how um, what what are the risks and benefits of each of the potential options. So it's really educating patients, educating providers of the different options. Some patients may still feel that an, a transplant is in their best option for a lot of reasons, and and someone may feel that um, that an LBAD is 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 as good and. And can, if it delays the need for a transplant, they may feel that as, as a significant benefit. So I think it really helps us provide personalized decision-making for, for patients. I really appreciate the nuance in that answer. Dr. Canwar, anything on your end about how these results might impact your opinion on LVAD over transplant? Yeah, and just to sort of echo what Dr. Bagani just mentioned, I think that Change I have seen in how I've approached it. This this is used to be something I would think should be offered to the patients, but you know, there's always this uh, inherent sort of uh, reluctance, if I may, when we discuss that because we associate it with all these adverse events. So if you have a young patient, shouldn't they be best served with an option that seemingly offers them, you know, better quality of life or longevity of life? And now we know, because it's a data-driven as opposed to opinion-driven or a bias-driven uh, narration that the conversation you have with your patient is, we can truthfully say to them, look, this is going to offer you an equivalent five-year survival. But if you look at it in the trajectory of long-term options, especially in young patients, this may be of sort of se sequential benefit as opposed to either or. Because I've always felt very pained sometimes at this discussion is which is better, VAD versus transplants. I think they're both excellent tools. Sometimes we can, you know, only offer one of or the other to a patient. But in those four candidates for both, I would love to see that we can use this as a sequential therapy, therefore prolonging that that specific patient's uh, chances of living the longest possible life and knowing that these are both, you know, very involved decisions. So this is best, again, as much as we can offer data to a patient rather than just our own opinions and sometimes inherent biases is what we had set out as our goal for the Intermax report. 
So thank you for that answer. And really what I take away from that is that now patients have more options in many cases, and they'll be able to choose between one or the other with the help of their provider and whatever is best for them. On the side of the cardiology community, what do you wish the cardiology community knew about LVAD therapy, Dr. Kanwar? I think that answer, uh, you know, bo both my uh, sisters are practicing cardiologists, not heart failure. And I always feel they have this if I use them as a representative of general cardiology community is like VAD is something that is sort of as an extreme therapy only to be sort of resorted to in absolute last case scenarios. And, you know, of course, it's a therapy for end stage heart failure. It's not something we would offer as a first line therapy by any means. But I wish if I were have, you know, it be a perfect world is that we start engaging this dialogue earlier, understanding that in today's days and age, it's not the therapy it was 20 years ago. It offers a excellent chance of survival with very little uh, uh, adverse event burden, but really not to wait till the last minute before saying, well, it's this or die, because then it becomes a high, much more riskier option. And if you have a patient that you think is struggling with signs of advanced heart failure, I think the key is if they are going in and out of the hospital and you're not able to do well by them with medical therapy, which, uh, you know, is, is excellent in today's days and age. But despite good medical therapy, you think yeah, they're slowly heading in the wrong direction to not wait till the last minute when they are in, you know, in a shock state or kind of crash and burn scenario, because then an option that could have been offered to them earlier on is no longer sometimes available. So in to summarize, I would just say is if you have a patient who's struggling with heart failure, is to please reach out to your heart failure colleagues to see if they could be an option for, you know, advanced options such as that, because really the uptake of this should be in patients who are maybe not as sick as and the final throes of their life. And we would love to be able to partner with you in deciding what, you know, if this patient is the right candidate. And we shouldn't just assume that they may or may not be because of certain preconceived notions. Thank you, Dr. Cameron. And how about you, Dr. Pagani? Do you have a message to the cardiology community? Uh, the message I would say is that really, we as a heart, fa heart, heart failure community really needs to educate and provide information to our colleagues, our referral base, uh, beyond the heart failure community, what the current outcomes and what the um, life expectancy is with LVAD therapy. The, imp the improvements that we've seen with current technology are so important. There's been such a significant uh, reduction in stroke. The risk of stroke now is not much different than someone with atrial fibrillation after the you know out of the long term and, and long term follow up if you look at uh, the risk of pump thrombosis something that was very common with the older generation of pump the ri the risk of pump thrombosis is close to you know um less than half a percent or even even less lower than that so it is with some of the really important complications have uh, been significantly eliminated or significantly improved uh, with the current technology well, Dr. Pagani, thank you for going in-depth on that. And Dr. Kanwar, thank you so much for your time today. We've really appreciated the opportunity to interview you. And that's me signing off.